and welcome everybody. Thank you very much for tuning in with us. My name is Esme and I'm a producer for the How To Academy and tonight it's my job to introduce our guest. Joining us is Scott Barry Kaufman. Um, Scott is a humanistic psychologist who explores the depth of human potential. He's taught courses at Columbia, NYU and UPenn and he also hosts the number one psychology podcast in the whole world which is titled The Psychology Podcast. Tonight, he'll be talking about how you can become a whole person and reimagining Maslow's classic hierarchy of needs for the 21st century. Scott will present for around 40 minutes and then he'll take questions for the final 20. So if you'd like to ask something, please put your questions in the Q&A box, which is at the bottom of your screen. And Scott has also asked that the chat be open. So please feel free to share your feedback with Scott as he presents. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Scott Barry Kaufman. Thank you, Esme. I, so, I appreciate it so much. That was a wonderful intro. Um, hey, everyone. Thanks for making it today um, to this event. And I really would encourage you to write things in the chat box as I go along, because I really like that feedback. I like to hear where you're coming from um, and how you're engaging with the material. So I'm going to just share my screen right now. Chat window there. Great. So I can see. So can everyone hear me? Can If someone can just... Uh, if even just one person can say, I can hear you, then I, I'll feel good. Okay, excellent. Excellent. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> okay. A thousand people. Uh, excellent. Um, thank you so much for coming today. Like I said, I really want to um, help you all through this time, um, learn how you can live more of a creative, fulfilled, and connected life. Um, Bridget says you are not on the full screen, um, but can you see the slides? Can you see my slides? at least. Good. Great. Uh, so one of my uh, he heroes, intellectual heroes, is the humanistic psychology, humanist, humanistic psychologist Abraham Maslow. Uh, Abraham Maslow had this whole theory of self-actualization in the 50s and 60s that has been lost in a lot of ways. And I've been on this mission to bring back a lot of the ideas of the humanistic psychologists for the 21st century so we can learn how to uh, bring those insights and wisdom into living an existence that is not just happy um, uh, because happiness is very fleeting um, but to feel whole and to feel uh, vital feel like we're living a really vital and engaged life this is a quote from maslow in one of his unpublished essays as i was going through and, and doing research i discovered some really really nice gems in some of his writings um, he was talking about what is self-actualization? What does it mean? He said, well, we try to make a rose into a good rose rather than seek to change roses into lilies. It necessitates a pleasure in the self-actualization of a person who may, be who may be quite different from yourself. It even implies an ultimate respect and acknowledgement of the sacredness and uniqueness of each kind of person. My interest in this topic and in what it means to uh, realize your full potential and to um, have your whole self appreciated, started very young in my life, actually. Uh, when I was, the uh, first couple of years of my life, I was essentially deaf. I had so much fluid in my ears. It made it very hard to hear things in, in real time. And the teachers thought I, uh, they thought I was stupid, quite frankly. <laughs> they, I, they also thought I was quite odd. I uh, would used to uh, be very creative and I used to uh, just have such a rich imagination and uh, when the teacher was reading stories to the class, I would like run around in like my Superman cape and <laughs> and just kind of live it. I was living in my own little world. And, um, I, you know, growing up and in the special education classroom that I was in um, because of my auditory learning disability, I just dawned on me that the other kids that were in special education were uh, not having their potential realized or um, or being appreciated by the teachers, by even the parents. And I just remember very, very young, kind of wanting to take on this mission in life to, um, you know, I just want to like show people, like, look at this person's potential, you know, look at that person's potential, you know, it's just um, we're not we're not seeing it. We have very limited notions of what people are capable of, um, and mostly because of the, the structures we build up, you know, like the education system is 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 basically everything you could possibly do to um, not realize a, a, a child's full potential. You, know, you look at a lot of organizations, um, you look at the workplace, um, you know, are we really bringing out people's passions and unique skill sets? Are we, are we honoring the unique sacredness of each person's existence in society? Um, I think that we have a long way to go. 
So I'm curious, have any of you ever heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs? Um, usually it's, and you can just actually write in the chat box if you've heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, excellent. Um, so uh, it's a great starting place to know that, that so many of you have heard of it. Usually the way that Maslow's hierarchy of needs is depicted is as a pyramid. Um, I cheekily put Wi-Fi at the bottom because this is like a meme, a meme that's going around. Uh, you know, where uh, some people are putting toilet, toilet paper right now as the most pressing need during COVID. But anyway, the idea here is that, uh, that there's a hierarchy of needs where a certain um, needs have to be met to a certain degree in order for you to uh, go on to the next need. So need for safety, um, like food, water, need for security. And then if you have, uh, you feel safe, you feel secure, um, you feel like you have uh, enough food. Um, your physiological needs are met, then um, you uh, can focus on your social needs, um, your belonging needs. Um, then if that feels enough secure, you can focus on your uh, respect, self-esteem, pride for your work. And then if that's to a certain degree, then self-actualization here is at the top. But it, it turns out, and I'm gonna uh, blow your mind, maybe, maybe not, but it turns out that Maslow never drew a pyramid. Um, I've been, uh, you know, doing this research for the past five, six years, um, going through his writings, going through, and I'm like, where's the pyramid? I don't see the pyramid anywhere in any of his writings. And uh, it turns out that it was just a bunch of management psychologists uh, who were doing a textbook trying to visually depict Maslow's hierarchy. Karen, I'm glad I blew your mind because it's, uh, you know, it blew my mind. It blew my mind when I, when I, when I was looking into that literature. I was like, wow, you know, the way Maslow actually thought about human potential is just so different than the way it's just depicted in, in virtually every introductory psychology textbook or virtually every organizational textbook. You know, people are learning this theory and I, they're not learning it the right the right way. So I really am excited to be here and give and, and be able to, uh, to, to, to teach you uh, what, what, you know, the real spirit of self-actualization and also my own science that I've been conducting on this. Uh, the past 20 years, I've been conducting science on human potential and creativity and intelligence, trying to really get at what it what it really means to self-actualize and, and what it really takes. So Maslow's um, uh, really what he did is he emphasized the distinction between deficiency needs um, and um, growth needs, or the, or the diff he also another way he put it is the deficiency realm of human existence and the being realm of human existence. He said it was like taking a cloudy lens and uh, and suddenly being able to see clearly again. Just maximize the screen here. Yeah, it's like being able to, to suddenly see clearly again. Uh, when you are motivated by deficiency and you're in the deficiency motivation of human existence, you are motivated by things that um, you're demanding on the world. You want the world to change in some way to accommodate your deficiency. So you, you, for instance, when you're hungry, um, you're in the. It, when you're very hungry, you're feed me, feed me. Where's food? When you're um, connection starved, you, everyone looks like a potential friend. You know, will you be my friend? Will you, will, you know, how do I belong? Um, when you're starved of self-esteem, uh, you know, you demand respect, you know, you, I demand respect, I demand that people um, give me, but what you're doing in the deficiency realm is you're trying to change the world and bend the world to your own deficiencies. But when you can um, enter the being realm or the growth realm of human existence, suddenly you see reality really clearly for what it is, not for what usefulness it serves for you. You can have awe and wonder and admiration for others who are very different from you, but you, you acknowledge that they're their own separate being. Um, and you, know, you can cultivate in the being realm, you can cultivate more a sense of purpose um, and a sense of mission and a sense of universal love. So I thought a better metaphor, you know, drum roll, please. Dun, 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 dun. Um, I thought a better metaphor for um, a hierarchy of needs um, rather than a static pyramid, 
you know, that treats life like a video game, uh, you know, where you meet, you reach one level of need and then um, some voice from above is like, congrats, you've unlocked connection and you can move on. Life is not like that. I thought a better metaphor was that life is really like a sailboat. So I have a revised hierarchy of needs for the 21st century. Um, and let me just explain why I think a sailboat is a better metaphor for life. Do we have any sailors in, in, in here? I'm just curious if anyone's ever, uh, if anyone's ever done, uh, been on a sailboat before. Uh, David Buckingham has been on a sailboat. That's excellent. So the thing with uh, the sailboat is, you know, life is something to be experienced. Life is, uh, uh, there's so many unknowns in life. It's not like climbing, you know, to some top where you ever reach an end. You know, the, the self-actualization process is always ongoing. Um, but it's important to not have too many holes in your boat. With self-actualization, uh, with with the sailboat metaphor, you can't, um, you don't, if you don't feel safe, you don't feel secure, you don't feel connected, uh, you feel low self-esteem, uh, and you have too many holes in the boat, um, you won't go anywhere. You know, the water will come in and you'll drown. Um, hopefully you won't drown, but you'll feel like you're drowning. Uh, but if you have your holes, um, uh, if you have your, you know, um, there's no holes in the boat, right? So you feel like um, you feel safe, you feel secure in your boat, then you can feel safe to open the sail. And that's what you need to do to move. U ultimately, if you want to grow, you need to open that sail and go and move in a purposeful direction, knowing full well that there are no certainties in life, knowing full well that the um, the waves can come crashing down on us at any moment, knowing full well that um, the winds can be hard, but you still move with a purposeful direction, with a spirit of exploration, love, and purpose. So this is the actual concrete uh, revised hierarchy of needs. Um, this is grounded uh, in, in, in the latest science of human potential. So this is a, also, I think, a, an operating framework for lots of different concepts that you see in the self-help literature, but you also see in the positive psychology literature. I don't know if anyone's heard of uh, the field of positive psychology that I, that I work in, um, but uh, this is a, a sort of a unifying framework for that field. I'm just curious, has anyone heard of positive psychology? Is it, I, I think uh, it's a little bit, it's, uh, it's gaining traction um, in England and, and other places. Um, that's great. Someone said, uh, yes, Martin Selig, Marty Seligman. So Marty Seligman was my uh, colleague uh, at Penn. We, we ran the Imagination Institute together and uh, that was that was great fun. Um, great. Well, I'm so glad that, that you have so many people here that who said no, but curious. So there's a lot of, um, you know, I, I think that uh, my book Transcend, but the kind of ideas I'm presenting today kind of offer a framework for both humanist integrating humanistic psychology with positive psychology. And in fact, I'm curious, has anyone heard of humanistic psychology? That I'm, I'm even more curious about that. Oh, Susan David's a friend of mine. I saw someone wrote Susan David. She's wonderful. Um, cool. So let me just go through the different aspects of this, uh, this, uh, this, um, this, this model, this new model of human needs. You know, we have, you have security needs that are really important. So security needs, you have things like lack of extreme poverty, um, food certainty, uh, lack of harshness and unpredictability in the environment. Um, you have the need for connection, things like belonging, um, acceptance from others, intimacy, relatedness. The thing with the need for connection that I wanted to make clear is that the need for belonging is not the same thing as the need for intimacy. Um, a lot of people are striving for um, what they really want is intimacy. They really want a relatedness, but they're going at it and satisfying that need in the wrong way. Um, one of the insights of the humanistic psychologist is that we all have basic needs, but we go about satisfying those needs in drastically different ways. So someone might get involved in violent extremism or, or gangs or um, might uh, have political organizations that they get their entire sense of belonging from, but still feel deeply unfulfilled, still feel that deficiency in their heart. And it's because there's no relatedness there. You know, um, you know, you join a political organization, people only really, li really like you to the extent to which you agree with their political beliefs. The, the second you start to question it, 
you know, tell me if there's unconditional love and, uh, you know, <laughs> there, you know, so, so um, I think it's really important to think about your basic human needs and how are you going about satisfying them. That's going to be really important for um, your own sense of wholeness. Make sure that you're going right towards what you want. If you want intimacy and relatedness, find people that you feel um, uh, see the whole you and in which you care about the whole them, you know, go towards that, you know, as opposed to spending eight hours of your day on Twitter trying to get likes from strangers, you know, and still feeling deeply unfulfilled, you know, go right towards the need that you want to satisfy. Um, the need for self-esteem um, and, and go not only go toward the need, but try to satisfy it in the healthiest way. And, and, and that's what I'm trying to teach you today is what it means to satisfy these basic human needs in the healthiest way so that you can feel as whole as possible. Um, the need for self-esteem is, um, is distinguished from uh, narcissism. Uh, I've, done some re I've done a bunch of research showing that uh, there's a very unhealthy regulation of self-esteem that manifests itself as different forms of narcissism. So you can have uh, a grandiose form of narcissism that's kind of like the chest thumping form. I'm the greatest, I'm the greatest. Um, but you can also have a quieter form of narcissism that I've studied called vulnerable narcissism that's more introverted, um, but it's still uh, very detrimental to growth. So whereas people who score high in grandiose narcissism think they're entitled to special privileges, because um, they think they're great, they think they're superior. Uh, people who score very high in vulnerable narcissism think they're entitled to special privileges because of their suffering. So um, it turns out that both those forms of narcissism um, are, are not the healthiest way of uh, satisfying the need for self-esteem. Really what you wanna do to really feel whole and sad and satiated in your need for self-esteem is to develop real sense of competency, uh, mastery in something, become a valued social partner, a real valued social partner, you know, become the kind of person that people can trust, um, become, uh, you know, like, like genuinely exercise your care for others and garner your self-esteem from genuine accomplishments and genuine positive social relationships, not from a vulnerable core of narcissism or not from an inflated, puffed up, grandiose sense of self. Um, yeah, I'm so glad that Sally, you're interested in this. Um, I have lots of free resources on my webpage, scottbarrycoffman.com. Uh, lots of articles I've written about this stuff if you, don't, if you can't afford my book. Um, I have uh, so many free resources and things on my webpage and tests you can take, um, uh, self-actualization kinds of tests. They can tell you, um, uh, give you some insight. I even have a test on my website um, that'll tell you where you are on the light or the dark side of the Star Wars force, um, whether you're on the light side or the dark side. <laughs> so uh, it's a fun scientifically validated test that some of you may get a kick out of taking. Don't take it too seriously, you know, but it's a, it's a I, I really, I really enjoy scientifically validating these tests and then putting them on my webpage for people to take for free. Um, okay, the need for exploration uh, includes things like, um, and, and now, you know, now we're in the growth realm. So now, you know, what, what, what does it mean to, uh, to really open that sale? So I think that while the base of safety is, um, or the base of the boat is safety, the base of growth is exploration. Everything springs from a sense of social exploration, um, from, uh, you know, wanting to do adventure seeking, uh, uh, wanting to be, be able to grow from your experiences. There's a whole new field called post-traumatic growth. Um, uh, that's all about how can you learn and grow from your traumas. Um, uh, openness to being open to new experiences, being uh, intellectually curious about things. Um, I'm really interested in this need for exploration in particular because I've done a lot of work on creativity um, uh, and its, its linkages to uh, this need for exploration. One of the earliest researchers of creativity who uh, really did some seminal work on this topic was Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. And what he found in all of his studies of creative people, he said, if I had expressed in one word what makes their personalities different from others, it's complexity. They show tendencies of thought and action that in most people are segregated. They contain contradictory extremes. Instead of being an individual, each of them is a multitude. A, a journalist a couple of years ago asked me if, if I had to describe creative people in a word, 
or in a, in a phrase, what would I what would I say? And I said, you know, creative people have messy minds. Um, I really, uh, and I mean that in a good way. I mean that in a good way. How many people in this room have a messy mind? And what I mean by that is they're able to entertain contradictory things in their head at one time. They're able to shift between um, being deeply rational and then shift to being deeply emotional. You know, um, they're able to um, uh, be imaginative and then rational. You know, they're able to, so the, the thing with, with, with this is that creative people um, really have that complexity of things that most people view as contradictory. You know, uh, most people, you know, you're either a rational person or you're a really emotional person or, oh, you're, you know, creative or you're really analytical. But creative people say, screw, screw all those false dichotomies. You know, um, you know, you know, another one is masculine, you're feminine. You know, like creative people are able to be both. You know, they're able to um, mix and match um, all different aspects of the human experience without putting all these kind of labels on them, you know? Um, so that's.